Yes. So thanks, Conrad. Thanks, everyone. And welcome to our 68th installment of the MRF HLV SCI Echo. I am Dr. Gregory Boyce. I'm your facilitator this afternoon. And I uh, just want to welcome to the hub, Tisha, uh, who is our social worker. And with us joining us, just, just for camera, is Lisa Edwards. She is a social work student who is doing uh, the observership this week. And we invited her to participate in our echo session as part of the uh, experience of the observation. So today's uh, session, we're going to talk about uh, HIV and bone disease. And kind of the reason why I, I went in that direction and realized that sort of we were kind of in the middle of a kind of mini mini series in a way. We did uh, fatty liver disease and HIV, then uh, that's what we did weight gain and HIV. And I think it's, it's becoming more and more relevant how uh, with the aging of the, of the epidemic, you know, we passed 40 years of, of HIV just uh, last year, that we need to get a handle on and, and think about uh, more regularly and I think more systematically how we deal with issues associated with HIV and aging and these comorbidities uh, moving forward because as the, as the demographic transformation occurs among the person living with HIV, it's no longer in some places a disease of younger persons, you know, as I will come to that in the presentation, but we have to think differently about how we approach um, managing our patients. So again, thank you for, for, for uh, taking your time out to, to be with us today. And I'll just fire up the slides and we'll start the presentation in just a couple of seconds. Move that across. All right. So we're going to talk about HIV and the bone health. I hope everyone can see uh, the presentation. Good. So again, we want to thank uh, University of New Mexico as well as ITEC um, and University of, of Washington helped, who are instrumental in helping us pursue this ECHO program. Uh, I have no disclosures with respect to this presentation. And in terms of learning objectives, we're going to outline some of the common types of bone disease affecting persons living with HIV. We're going to discuss some of the factors contributing to osteoporotic bone disease among persons living with HIV and briefly describe screening and treatment strategies for identifying and managing osteoporotic bone disease among persons living with HIV. So when we, if it, by way of quick overview, in terms of the commonest diseases that affect persons with HIV, uh, be, in terms of chronic diseases would be osteoporosis, which is what uh, we we're gonna focus on today. And the characteristics would be reduced bone mass and altered bone quality with a show the uh, image on that, and is associated with increased risk of fractures among persons living with HIV. We're familiar with the concept of, of fragility fractures, you know, someone stumbles going down a step and they, they break the, they hit or they break the lung, right? Or maybe they, they, they trip and stumble on, on a chair and, 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 and they fracture a vertebra, right? And you know, unlike what I think is the common belief, uh, osteoporosis tends to be asymptomatic until a fracture occurs. Right, there, there is a cost of a, a belief among non-medical persons that if I have a pain, it's osteoporosis, I need to get an extra or something. No, if you have a pain because of osteoporosis, you've probably broken something. And um, etiology is multifactorial, and we'll come to that in greater detail. Osteomalacia, or what we used to call rickets a long time ago, is it's characterized by expected bone mineralization, primarily associated with the vitamin D deficiency. And it is thankfully fairly rare, but not impossible. Again, we'll talk a little bit about vitamin efficiency um, among persons living with HIV. And it is associated with a greater risk of fractures, but also of bone pain and muscle weakness, which is one of the clinical features of vitamin D deficiency, as opposed to osteoporosis, which is largely asymptomatic. And finally, it's osteonecrosis. I think some of the medical persons would, would note as a vascular necrosis, uh, which is caused by an infarct or, or, or a death uh, due to lack of blood supply of the epiphyseal plate of the growth plate of long bones that results in acute and fairly severe 
bone pain. Uh, we, it is not something I've seen recently, but in some of the early pre art um, times, we did see some persons who had um, osteoporosis of the hip and, and required hip replacement, and that sort of thing. Uh, it is rare, um, but it is more common in persons with HIV and some of the other risk factors are things like low CD4 counts, steroid use, alcohol abuse, and injection drug abuse, which is not as common in Trinidad and Tobago and, and the Caribbean in general. So we are aware of, of this shift in the HIV epidemic, whereby uh, in, in 2020 in the US, more than three out of five persons live with HIV over the age of 50. And it, is, it was uh, projected in a Lancet paper that you know, almost three quarters in the next decade would be over the age of 50. And as I would have said in the introduction, this has tremendous implications for how we think about how we manage persons living with HIV moving forward. Because uh, in the post-ART era, a lot of what we did was essentially infectious disease management. Not a lot of what we do is chronic disease management. We're thinking about bone health, kidney health, liver health, uh, cardiovascular disease, neurologic complications. Because the medications work, they work well. Persons who are adherent can reliably be suppressed to unacceptable levels for the rest of their lives. And what we're, what we're thinking of now is how do we shepherd those persons into a long and healthy life living with HIV. So at MRF, as of fairly recently, the, the number of persons, the percentage of persons living with HIV, living with HIV attending our clinic above the age of 50 was just, just over a third. And, and if our transformation is going to look anything like uh, places we that have had a longer anti viral treatment history than we have, uh, I suspect that number is going to go up over time. So what is the impact of osteoporotic bone disease? So we know there is an increased mortality risk for both major and minor fractures, especially as persons get older. And we do have some 80 or some 80 year old and plus patients in our clinics. And there is an increased mortality after a major fracture, especially for example, hip fractures, 10 years out after the event, it's an enduring thing. So if you look at the graphs on the right side of the screen, that is the mortality associated with both in women and in men uh, after hip fracture. And you realize there's uh, 120 months after the fracture, we're not back down to, to, to normal mortality. It never quite gets back down to normal. So these are life course altering events. And there is, oh, and separate and apart from the mortality hit, there's a significant quality of life hit post, post a fracture, for example, if someone has, you know, has required a knee replacement and, and it's painful and they and have arthritis and so on, it impairs the person's ability both to move around, to be independent and have a normal quality of life. And all that comes with significant cost of public healthcare systems uh, for post-fracture care, as well as the impact that um, the reduced quality of life uh, among persons who have had these major fractures um, has on, on healthcare systems all over the world. And uh, it can run to billions of dollars every year. So one of the things that became increasingly apparent um, as persons with HIV live longer and longer is that regardless of age, Persons living with HIV um, have an increased risk of, 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 of fracture um, at, uh, at, at, at any age. So these graphs are from a fairly old paper as far back as 2008, right? That showed that um, both at the, at the spine and the hip, there was increased rates of, of fracture, as I said, both um, uh, osteoporotic bone fracture, both at the, the hip and at the spine. Unfortunately, I don't think the, the labels came out. And this is from a 2018 meta-analysis, which essentially looked at a lot of different papers and averaged out that persons living with HIV were more than twice likely, more than twice as likely to suffer from a fracture, or whether it's a fragility fracture or any other type of fracture, than HIV negative cohorts. And the other meta-analyses where that can uh, that increased risk was three times and more higher. Now, before we go any further, I just want to talk about what, what we mean when we talk about osteoporosis. So uh, WHO put together a working group and came together with a definition that it, osteoporosis is a disease characterized by low bone mass and microarchitectural deterioration of bone tissue. So if you look at the picture on the top right, we sort of see how with normal bones, in terms of the, the, the what you call the trabecular structure, the, the inside of the bone, it is fairly tight, it's fairly, it's fairly well meshed. But with osteoporotic bone, that, that, um, that internal structure becomes much more open, much more 
are much so much less dense and much more fragile. I think almost it's almost like uh, uh, a new dense sponge with the old sort of porous sponge whereby the structure is falling apart. And that bone becomes much more uh, frail and much more uh, fragile. Right? So, now, in terms of what the operational definition is, if, if how do I diagnose someone with, with osteoporosis? So the operational definition is, and I'll read it out, the finding of what we call a T-score of less than 2.5 standard deviations at the lumbar spine, the femur neck, which is the, the long bone in the thigh, or the total hip by bone and mineral density testing using what we call DEXA scan, which is dual energy X-ray absorbiometry. Now, what this means essentially is that using an X-ray technique, the, the, the density of the bone is assessed. And using that assessment, the density of that person's bone, let's say my patient, patient X, gets that uh, bone scan done. His density is compared to, um, using the T-scan, um, the a reference population's peak bone density. So this is persons around year 25 and 30 um, who would have had data collected and their bone density measurements would have been collated and compared to this person's bone mineral density. And depending on how much more or less dense that person's bone is compared to that reference population, you would get a score. So if it's what we call one, and this is one of the statistical things we talk about, if it's one statistical uh, deviation away from the average, then it's, it's plus one or minus one. If it's, let's say, two statistics, uh, standard, standard deviation, sorry, away from the mean, it's minus two or plus two. So if you are two standard deviations, two and a half standard deviations or more, less dense than this reference population, that's considered um, diagnostic of uh, osteoporosis. Now, there are lesser degrees of bone loss. Osteopenia would be minus one to minus 2.49. And anything above minus one, meaning less than one standard deviation away from the average is considered normal. Now, there is also a, a different score. There's T scores also a Z score, in which case the person, as a patient of mine who I'm doing this bone scan on, they're not compared to you know, the, 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 the peak bone density of, of a reference population. It's, it's compared to someone else of around that age and race, because remember, bone mineral density um, does change based on age and as, as, as well by race. And they would tend to use this for younger populations who have not yet achieved peak bone density. So it's kind of unfair to, to compare someone to, to, some, to somewhere they haven't um, um, arrived yet in terms of their, their growth and development. And the reason why these things are important, so the, 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 the further away you get, and sometimes those, those these scores can get into negative three and negative four, right? They're the way down in terms of density. The, for each deep standard deviation away from the mean, the risk of a fracture increases two to three fold. So this is what a DEXA scan looks like, a non-invasive outpatient procedure. Essentially, this is low energy x-rays. You don't have to inject anything into your veins, so you should look anything up. And it can be, and it's the same in the procedure, and you get to actually report uh, uh, in, in your doctor's office or wherever like that. My concern about this, I don't know how much of this we have in the public sector. And, and to a certain extent, some part of this presentation, I think is going to be aspirational because to, in order to get a bone scan right now, if I'm, if I, if I'm correct, most persons would probably have to go and pay for it. And given the population that we know living with HIV, most of them won't be able to, to, to get a bone scan done because it'd be too expensive for them to afford. It's not very expensive, but we do have quite a few people who couldn't afford this sort of testing. And moving forward, given what we know about how our patients are going to age and the need to think about monitoring bone health, right? I would, I would ask all the persons here, um, who are involved in care, when's the last time they asked or thought about the patient's bone health, right? Or if we have any, uh, if you have peers with us, when's the last time a doctor in this country inquired to or investigated bone health, right? I mean, hand up, I can't, ha having gone through this presentation, I can't, I don't think I've done it once, except if my patient got a fracture, I think, oh, this person probably was a right? And that must be a wrong approach. We have to think about screening to prevent events rather than intervening after the event has already occurred. So what are some of the host factors associated with osteoporosis? So things like weight loss and which can be a feature of advanced HIV. It does give the bones a hit. 
in terms of the mineral density. Uh, physical inactivity, we, uh, we know that if, if, if you bone uh, structure tends to be maintained by muscular contraction on those bones. If someone is just bedridden, their bones waste away. I put a couple of things in blue, hypogonadism, which means low sex hormone levels. It's important because it's one of the things we are learning more about in terms of men and women living with HIV and, and, and the rates of developing uh, hypogonadism over time. Smoking and alcohol, multiple studies demonstrate that persons with HIV tend to uh, smoke more, tend to use alcohol more. Glucocorticoid use, which is steroid use, which is usually as part of a medical um, indication. Lipodystrophy, again, this is a throwback to some of the older drugs we used to use and its impact on, on, on the body's metabolism. It has a knock-on effect to fatty liver, it has a knock-on effect with weight, and we see it here pairing again with bone disease. Uh, chronic kidney disease is, is, is well known in terms of its perturbation with vitamin D as well as parathyroid hormone. Vitamin D deficiency, again important. Uh, the, the British um, guidelines suggest that as many as one in three persons living with HIV in the UK have severe vitamin D deficiency. And remember, vitamin D is very important in terms of bone and calcium metabolism. And the risk factors for vitamin D deficiency overlap with a lot of the patients we see in this country. Um, a darker skin persons, a person of, 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 of African descent, of, of non-white uh, descent, tend to have a, a greater risk of vitamin D deficiency, as well as persons who are nifavirins. And remember, the, still all of our, our major backbone is still nifavirins based. We're not in the process of transitioning, but we, it's still in, in, in significant use. And so hepatitis C infection, which is not so common in Trinidad because there's less in injection drug use, as well as short stature and delayed puberty, more so in children. So in terms of what some of the viral factors are, so for the last several presentations, we have been sort of knocking this, this door and, and, and banging this, 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 this drum about um, immune activation and, and what the effects of, the, of having a chronic immune activation does. And one of those effects is it causes increased uh, inflammatory markers. We spoke about that in silicon 6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, uh, rank ligand um, um, uh, factor as well. And what those particular inflammatory mediators do in terms of bone, remember there are cells in the bone that are responsible for bone formation, which are called osteoblasts. And there are cells in bone that are responsible for bone resorption called osteoclasts, right? And in the face of all these inflammatory uh, markers, you get more osteoclasts, which is bone resorbing activity as opposed to osteoblast, which is bone form forming activity. So that you would find that for, no, for the simple reason of chronic immune activation and, uh, and immune constitution post antiretroviral therapy, it changes the metabolic balance in, in terms of, of, of bone in person with HIV. And, it, and in addition to all the traditional risk factors we just spoke about, and, and persons who are not well controlled and they have more inflammatory uh, uh, activity that persons who are well suppressed, um, they tend to, to, to shift towards, a, 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 I don't want to use a, 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 as harsh a as destructive bone balance, but in a, a balance more towards loss of bone rather than maintenance of bone. And in terms of what is the impact of treatment, so this is uh, actually a, a fairly old, it's more than 10 years old, but it was an analysis of a, a study that was done comparing um, Emerson to Nofver versus Lamovia Bacavir as what they call the nucleoside backbone in a regimen versus Ifabrens and Atazanavir with Bruce's Vertonavir. And what they found on the, the chart to the left, the pink line is bone mineral density in the spine uh, in, uh, up to 192 weeks after initiation of a regimen containing a Bacavir Lamovia versus the dash blue. Uh, to Nofver and Recidivir, and you see the big difference, the, 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 the change in bone mineral density quitting down to minus four, right? Up to 48 weeks, and then kind of goes up a little bit and then levels off. Where in, in the Tenofovir containing arm versus in the back of the containing arm, it again dips down at around 48 weeks, and then starts to head back up to normal. And in terms of the anchor drug, where it's Ifavrens, that is Ifavrens, you see the difference as well. That Ifavrens were associated with less bone loss than uh, atazanavir, tonavir. So it, it, was a, it was early warning that 
uh, at Zanif, at both to North Africa containing regimens as well as some Bushi Portuguese inhibitors characterized by Atazanavir result in a bone loss, some of which is partially reversible over time. And again, this is not at spine but at hip. You see this similar change in terms of tenofovir versus abacavir on the left, but in terms of efavirenz and atazanavir, there's not much difference. So there is some differential activity based on the site of bone loss. So there's more bone loss in spine versus hip based on, on, on these, these drugs. And this is a more recent analysis. So this would be um, what we call the advanced trials. So this is a released just last year. And remember the advanced trial was comparing two different forms of tenofovir. So tenofovir alafenamide, which is quote unquote new tenofovir, which has less renal and bone effects versus uh, old tenofovir, which is what it was tenofovir disoproxyl and dolutegravir versus what was standard of care at the time, which is a triple, right? Old tenofovir, quote unquote, plus tembrocytobine, plus efavirenz. So if we were to see again, um, so the total um, body bone mineral density at all sites, you realize there was a, there was a decrease of the 48 weeks and then either leveling off, or in the case of tenofovir alafenamide, a gradual re-increase. But if we again look at hip versus spine, in terms of the, the change in bone density at the hip, tenofovir had the least effect and was leveling off or going, up, or going back up by 144 weeks. Uh, tenofovir disoproxyl plus efavirenz, again, you saw that dip and at week 144, it's still trending down. And tenofovir disoproxyl, which is again, all tenofovir plus dorotegavir, again, uh, dip continuing down at night, so it's kind of leveling off. But notice the, the, the big difference between tenofovir alafenamide at the top versus all tenofovir at the bottom. There is a, a large difference in terms of impact on bone and this is at hip. And at spine, you can see the difference as well that tenofovir alafenamide, again, a dip at, up to week 48, and then almost back up to normal by week 144. Whereas the, the, there was a similar trend with both forms of tenofovir disoproxyl plus tenofovir uh, plus um, dolitegravir or efavirenz, but not back up to normal yet at week 144, right? In terms of what this means with respect to fracture, there's been a lot of conflicting evidence in terms of tenofovir and bone fractures. Some say there is an increase, some say there isn't. They've done studies with pre-exposure prophylaxis, which uses tenofovir, and the, 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 the prep studies didn't show a difference in, in actual incidence of fractures, but I think this is something that is going to take a, a, a little longer to tease out in terms of what these what signals actually mean. So in the absence of the fancy DEXA scanning machine, what do we do? So there is a tool called a FRAX calculation tool. It's a free tool on the internet. The URL is down at the bottom. And essentially what you do, you select your location you see, and, and based on your location, you actually be able to select different ethnic groups. And then you enter various indicators, for example, sex, height, if you had a previous fracture, if you smoke, if you're on steroids, if you have secondary osteoporosis. And one of the things that we, uh, it was realized that in the same way as the freeing and risk calculator for cardiovascular disease underestimates cardiovascular risk among persons with HIV because it doesn't account for the effect of HIV on cardiovascular risk. The FRAX score does not uh, fully account for the effect of HIV on bone health, so it underestimates the risk of fracture, right? So uh, in our, our patients with HIV, we kind of have to take that risk with a tiny grain of salt and, and understand that it's probably a little bit higher. There is a, a, a spot for, for uh, bone mineral density, but if it's not there, it can still calculate your risk. And based on the risk you calculate, you can make decisions. So if the 10-year risk of fracture is less than 10%, you reassure the patient, repeat the FRAX in 10 years. If it's between 10 and 20, you should consider doing actual DEXA scanning if it's available, um, because it, it suggests that this person may have uh, a profile that in the next several years, we'll put them at risk for, for a significant event. And you can think about optimization of lifestyle and come to that in terms of exercise and avoiding things that worsen bone health and um, screening for and managing vitamin D deficiency. And if it's above 20%, again, optimize the risk factors, we'll come to that. Consider reviewing the antiretroviral therapy. So we spoke about enough variance effect on bone. And if someone is showing signs that there are significant risk of, of an event in the next 10 years, 
uh, there should be some consideration made to altering their, 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 their backboard. Or if they haven't started treatment yet and done the frac score at baseline, I understand that they're at high risk, potentially consider based on availability of agents where you are, whether or not it's an appropriate uh, choice to put them on the tenor or containing margin. So, uh, and so this is uh, the, so the previous guidelines were more or less uh, the, the, the UK guidelines. These are some of the American guidelines, um, essentially similar, except that they would tend to start screening at an earlier age um, with, with some of these, these tools. The, the, the British tennis starts around 50. Uh, the, some of the UK guidelines that came out in, um, in I think the, uh, in one of the, the, the uh, guidelines for primary care of persons with HIV. They suggest uh, starting in a, a decade earlier, 40 to 49. And even premenopausal women starting from age 40 and reassess every several years. And in terms of the indication for DEXA scanning, so the, the UK guidelines tend to suggest fast calculation first and then consider screening. The Americans are sort of similar, they don't recommend routine DEXA screening on all persons, but um, in postmenopausal women, because of the effect of menopause on bone health, um, all postmenopausal women they recommend have DEXA scanning done, and all men above the age of 50. And any younger person in whom the FRAC score suggests that they have more than 10% risk of, of a fracture in the next 10 years. And any uh, adult with a major fragility fracture risk factor, for example, prolonged steroid use or um, um, a previous fragility fracture who presents to your care. So in terms of how we go ahead with the management of persons uh, who seem to are diagnosed with osteoporotic bone disease. So in terms of who we treat, and when I say we, I mean not necessarily um, the HIV practice, the HIV treating clinician, if they require a referral to an endocrinologist or, or an, orthopedic, uh, an orthopedic team, uh, anyone with a hip or vertebral fracture should be treated and will come to what that treatment looks like. Um, anyone with a DEXA T-score less than 2.5 anywhere, and remember that DEXA scan less than 2.5, that T-score less than 2.5 is diagnostic of osteoporosis. So you don't wait for them to, to break something before you start treat to treat. Uh, a FRAC score, more than 20% uh, um, risk of a lumbar spine fracture or more than 4% risk of a hip fracture in the next 10 years. And when you, when you actually run the DEXA scan, they give you that, that differential risk, both at lumbar spine and at hip. Or uh, someone who's osteopenic, meaning between a, a T-score between a minus one, a minus 2.49, but also has a FRAC score that suggests that they have a greater than 3% risk of a hip fracture or 10% or uh, a 20% risk of a major osteoporotic fracture. So how do we go about um, uh, managing the patient? So first thing we need to do is think about preventing falls because a lot of the, the, as I sort of mentioned, Earlier, you know, a lot of these fractures occur in the home, right? You, you slip on a wet tile, you stumble going down a step, you trip over a chair or maybe some loose rug and it can't catch your foot and you tumble over. So one, assess fall risk because sometimes just asking the patient, are you concerned about falling? Are you unsteady on your feet? Because some of our patients know, look, I, I, I'm not happy with how I'm moving around, I'm almost stumbling around, almost, almost killing it down the steps. And then intervene to see how best we can make that home environment less treacherous for them. So educate about footwear, about slippery surfaces. Some person may require some physical therapy to get their, their, uh, their, their balance muscles and their posture muscles back up to scratch. And modification of their lived environments, so they move trip hazards, like loose cords, as I said, bunched up carpets, those sort of things. And this is a motility assist devices. So it's, for example, if someone's having difficulty with stairs, you know, you, so we, you know, on the TVC, you stay a master, you sit down and it takes you up. So you have to navigate those stairs potentially by yourself late at night when something terrible might happen. In terms of antiretroviral treatment, as I said before, consider um, switching off to Nofavir or not starting to Nofavir in somebody who's a significant risk of an osteoporotic fracture. And you know, the WHO guidelines is kind of the only place they speak to bone health. In, in the entire guideline, um, which is uh, hopefully will change over time. Because I think uh, the other guidelines, European guidelines, British guidelines, 
and uh, the, the American Guidelines for Primary Care of Persons Living with HIV are there already. I think we need to catch up on it. Uh, other parts of management, so vitamin D or calcium supplementation were indicated. It is best to try and get calcium into the person's diet via the foods they eat, and then after that, their assessment is done to see how much calcium they're getting, supplant whatever they, 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 are, they are deficient in, up to about 1,000 to 1,200 uh, grams a day, milligrams a day, sorry, kilogram of calcium is bad. Um, smoking cessation, reduction of alcohol consumption, and resistance and weight-bearing exercise. Remember, aerobic exercise is good for cardiovascular fitness, but not as good for bone health. So you need some amount of resistance exercise to really build bone strength. And in terms of the actual drugs we use, um, so some of the bisphosphonates, uh, so alendronate and zeledronic acid, I think it's Fosamax and Zometa, we really you know them by. Um, uh, the Fosamax is given orally, alendronate is given orally, um, and there, are, there can be some GI side effects that you have to be mindful of. Uh, zeledronic acid is given intravenously, and um, with both of those drugs, as well as any of the what you call anti-resorptive medications, meaning that drugs that are used to try to, as we spoke before, stem osteoclast activity and reduce the amount of bone that's being resorbed, all of the drugs in that category have the potential for uh, sort of a rare side effect, either a typical femoral fracture, which are just below what we call the greater trochanter. So if you kind of poke at your hip, that bone on the side you feel poking back out your teeth is a greater trochanter. So with some of these drugs, it increases the risk of having a uh, a rare fracture at that site or osteonecrosis of the jaw, which is actually very uh, rare, but it's important to recognize because it can be very stressing. Um, Denosumab, which is an anti uh, rankling and antibody, again, it decreases osteoclast activity, you can consider the use of estrogens or estrogen receptor modulators because remember, uh, the postmenopausal state is associated with, with, with bone loss. And the anabolic medications, medications that assist in, 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 in actual uh, production of bone, right? So the parathyroid hormone analogs, um, teriparatide and abaloparatide, I've never uh, had the, the, the ability to come across those drugs before. And there's a, a fairly new drug called sclerostin inhibitor. Now, sclerostin is actually one of the drugs that osteo... Uh, oh, okay. to... Uh, but also class used to affect osteoblast activity. So it's, <clears throat> again, uh, uh, an antibody that has been found to have a really significant effect in terms of increasing uh, bone production. So in, in summary, osteoporotic bone disease is a significant cause of morbidity and mortality among persons, among persons aging with, uh, aging person with HIV. And there are many factors, including certain antiretrovirals that contribute to negatively affecting bone health and increasing the risk of bone disease. And screening for bone health and early interventions uh, is essential to avoiding a life of fractures. And that's my presentation. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I'll open the floor to questions if anyone has any questions. Thanks so much. Thank you, Gregory, for forever beautiful presentations. Should we include vitamin D screening on a regular basis in our patients? Because we don't do that at all. Or rarely do we do that, given the fact that most of our patients are on TDF for a long time and they're continuing to be on that. And also that our patient group is also getting older, so they are more they have more chances of developing osteoporosis either from old age or because of menopause, plus the medications, plus the HIV. I think the short answer is probably yes. Um, I don't think we have a, a good handle on um, how uh, our patients are doing in terms of the vitamin D levels. And, you know, there's, there's this sort of this assumption that because we live in a tropical island, that everybody here gets a lot of vitamin D, but in my own case, for example, I, 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 I'm indoors all the time. I'm wearing long sleeves, so no sun exposure. Um, so I, I buy that, unless I'm getting it through my diet, I'm not, expo I'm not getting vitamin through, through sun. And you already know that the risk factors would be, you know, um, 
dark skin, and patients on efavirenz. So that is most of the patients we have in care right now, at least 3,900 of, of the 5,000 plus persons fall into that category on efavirenz, dark skin. So we have to think about it moving forward, not just because of, of bone health issues, but also because of the fact that um, uh, vitamin D levels increasingly are being recognized as linked to cardiovascular disease as well. So it, it, it's, it's a multifactorial thing we need to um, think about when it comes to vitamin D. Very true. And just like you put it, the other day, a friend of mine was requested to go and have a vitamin D level checkup. And I was wondering why the doctor thought about of that of all the, the, the tests to be done. And to my surprise, actually, her vitamin D levels were just below normal. So I don't think it's something which is very unusual, even though we live in the tropics. So we need to encourage that and maybe pick it up and uh, see what we can do. What about the, the role of just pain in assessing for osteoporosis? Because I, I don't think that came up much in the discussion or the presentation. It came up really early really well. I think it was the second slide. Okay, then so, no, that's okay. Then that's okay. No, 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 I, 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 I'll, 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 I'll say it again because it is important. A lot of our patients think this, that bone pain equals osteoporosis. And actual osteoporosis is usually asymptomatic unless a fracture has appeared, right? So sometimes you, you, know, you have older women coming in and saying, you oh, know, have some back pain or whatever is osteoporosis. And most of the time it isn't. Um, but that, the lack of symptoms does not mean that someone should therefore decide, well, I have no bone pain, I have no X, Y pain, my bones are fine, right? As I said, most people realize they have osteoporosis when they break something. So we need to think about screening ahead of onset of symptoms because it will never come. Greg, you're muted. This question, but the, the technology is giving trouble. So you mentioned 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams dosage is relative to vitamin C. Oh, it's, it's calcium, right? It's, it's calcium. Vitamin D dosing is a little bit, is a little different. Yeah. 